and welcome to a Building Smart webinar. This webinar is hosted by the Building Smart Regulation Room and is part of a series of open house sessions planned to occur in between the biannual Building Smart Summits. Thank you for joining. My name is Sheila Karai Lum and I, and I will be your moderator today. Today's webinar is titled Regulatory Open BIM is Underway. Our speakers are Nicholas Nisbet, Director at AEC3 Limited, Franco Coyne, who is the team lead at Building Smart Italy, Dr. Wawan Salihin, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Fornax, and Dr. Ibrahim Fardar, who is Digital Transformation and BIM expert at Dubai Municipality. This webinar is scheduled to last one to one and a half hours with a short Q&A at the end. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available in due course. Before I hand over to our speakers, I would like to remind you that your lines will remain muted for the duration of the presentations. If you have any questions or wish to make any comments, please use the chat function located within the control panel. I would also like to bring to your attention that Building Smart is committed to ensuring that participation in the development of standards is unrestricted and the process for their adoption is transparent. And standards that are being developed do not favor any particular provider and are open, non-binding and accessible to all. Please take note of our antitrust code of conduct, which is on the screen now. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to Nick to start the presentation. Thank you, Sheila. Um, we like to hold these uh, open house sessions uh, every six months. And I'm delighted that Franco and I from the regulatory room uh, are joined uh, by Dr. Warwan Sahulian and Dr. Ibrahim Fada. Um, the theme of the presentation today uh, is that open BIM, regulatory open BIM is underway and uh, that uh, all over the world there are uh, efforts, examples um, where the regulatory process is embracing open BIM and uh, starting to uh, uh, get the benefits um, that the standards that Building Smart International offers uh, both to uh, uh, for regulators uh, and for those who are regulated, those who are submitting uh, proposals and so on. Um, the uh, this uh, pro progress uh, is one that we encouraged we we discuss in our regulatory room, um, which is a pre standardization uh, uh, discussion forum. Um, and then we have working groups and projects that, de that uh, develop uh, standards uh, which can be incorporated into the suite of Building Smart Open BIM standards. Uh, today we're very interested to hear your reactions to the presentations and uh, our comments, uh, and we hope that uh, this will lead you to take further interest in, uh, in the regulatory room activities. Um, the underlying mission of our room, uh, and the room sits alongside uh, groups that are looking at building uh, in particular, and infrastructure in particular, and construction, and airports, and uh, building products, and so on. Uh, our mission is to look um, at the regulatory approval process, which are a major source of delay and risk uh, for projects worldwide. Uh, maybe we should say construction projects worldwide. Uh, we believe that uh, the use of open standards, and I'll say a little bit more about them uh, a bit later, uh, is the way to um, make progress in this area and to eliminate uh, that delay in risk. Uh, or certainly to minimize it. Uh, what I'd like you to do is now to hand over to Franco Coyne, who will update us on the uh, survey of the demand for open BIM, which we conducted uh, last year. Franco? Oh, thank you, Nick. Uh, good afternoon all. to everybody. Uh, in 2020, we started uh, as a regulatory room, and we asked ourselves, uh, uh, what, how was the perception of uh, open BIM in regulatory? And so we decided to launch a, a, 
a survey that has been quite successful in our opinion because more than 130 people, uh, um, professionals uh, answered to the questions uh, in from 36 countries. And the main outcome that we, can, we, we, we we had from that from that survey is that uh, the demand for open beam regulatory is growing because 75% of professionals declare that they are discussing the use of open beam in their in their approval processes and 70% of them were using of course talking about uh, IFC and open beam tools and the larger but the, but the most interesting stuff is uh, that large majority of survey attendants were more directly positive on the success of this process. This is uh, very interesting. If you want, next please, uh, Nick. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, sorry. Um, in, uh, if you want more, some more information about what we, what we gather during the, the survey, please download our report that uh, is available on the, um, on the Building Smart uh, uh, website. Um, the, and uh, please the next one. And the last thing I I would like to highlight from the from that is the last outcome that we had from the from the from the survey, but not only from the survey, also for, we can say from the many me and many years of activity of a regulatory room uh, in the in the field of uh, digital permitting is why is open being used in regulatory and the drivers are that we uh, highlighted but uh, that came from uh, from the market where the opportunity to get an independence uh, and accuracy and veracity to add the independence accuracy and veracity to the project and I hope that the, the, the experience the real spirit the, the, the direct experience of our uh, panelists today will also convince you as we are, that uh, the use of this process, uh, the use of open beam, is really also overwhelming all the worries that are uh, related to, to these processes. One of them is uh, the, 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 the related to complexity. The other one, another one, is uh, the perception of the two parts about the awareness of the process. Uh, uh, in both uh, in the other part, so it's like uh, they sometimes the the, the the industry is not so uh, uh, trusting. <laughs> it's not trusting is uh, about the the capability of the uh, of, uh, of the institution and on the uh, the other way around, and also in the dif this also the the practice that we are, what we are seeing is that practice is helping to overwhelm the different uh, opinion that we have in different layers in the same organization. So usually we have the technicians are a little bit more fan of uh, using the beam in the regulatory than their bosses. But let's go back to, to Nick and uh, please, uh, you're, you're, you can go ahead with the, with the, with the rest of, uh, of the presentation, okay. of, the, of the beginning of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, so, uh, just to say a little bit about what we mean by open BIM and what it is that's pushing it uh, to be relevant. Um, some key points uh, about open BIM. Uh, the most important one is that it is free to use. Uh, anyone, anywhere in the world, can read the open BIM standards, can download them, can build them into software. Uh, and put them to good use. Um, part of that is that the uh, Open BIM uh, standard, uh, the IFC in particular, is an ISO standard. Um, so it goes through the same rigor that, um, that many of the other standards we use in the construction business go through. Uh, and it's, uh, um, so it has this potential to be adopted universally. Um, in every jurisdiction around the world. Um, when I say it's free, I also mean that the tools to use it, um, some of which are free, some of them are low cost, uh, some of them, of course, are proprietary. Um, but there is a huge number of tools for viewing and inspecting 
uh, IFC information for filtering it, uh, measuring it, and most importantly, for uh, testing it against uh, regulatory expectations. Uh, it's particularly relevant to the regulatory processes because uh, the models can be uh, the descriptions of our construction projects are geo-referenced uh, so that they can fit into their context in planning and uh, mapping applications, uh, and they are time-stamped uh, so that uh, the uh, state of a model is defined at a particular moment in time, and of course that very often determines which regulations are applicable to it. Uh, another aspect that I just highlight is that the uh, Open BIM standards allow you to talk or convey information about the project, the process that you're undergoing, the transformation, whether it's uh, adaption of an existing facility or the proposal for a new one. Uh, starting with the site, it can convey uh, everything about the, uh, the spaces, the spatial breakdown, the locations uh, that make up the proposal, including zones um, or for different uh, groupings of space, and information about the uh, facility downwards into the systems and components uh, and products uh, that make up the, uh, the physical fabric of uh, our built environment. Uh, the standard covers uh, not only um, the geometry, which we, we, we know and see so often, but it uh, always uh, represents that geometry as being uh, one aspect of entities, real things, things that have got names like a beam or a door um, or a pump or a, 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 a road barrier. Um, and so every entity comes with its geometry, its properties, and also its connections to uh, other parts of the facility. So it's not just a list of, uh, of parts, uh, it is a web of information which allows um, the designers and the engineers to convey what um, what they intend, and it allows regulators to actually assess that um, and understand it and uh, look for the uh, issues uh, that, that are important in uh, each local jurisdiction. The IFC can be extended, uh, and I'll mention two ways in particular. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, locally, uh, within a jurisdiction, uh, additional properties can be added uh, to, the, uh, to the model, um, answering questions that may be specific to your, your jurisdiction. Um, we always talk about the requirements for uh, saunas and hot rooms, uh, because one of our committee members is from Finland. Um, as an example, where um, local requirements are always going to have to be covered. And the other area of flexibility is in the use of classification. Um, the uh, Open BIM standard allows any classification um, to be added in as additional uh, information. Uh, and many uh, jurisdictions have got their own classifications of uh, building types or, or project types. Uh, of uh, uh, site, uh, kinds of site. Uh, we may need to classify projects uh, as to whether they are renovation or uh, whether they count as new work and so on. So um, there's every opportunity to uh, make Open BIM and the IFC specific to the jurisdiction in which it's being used. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention about the, um, the what of open BIM is uh, that surrounding this, we have tools um, where you can define information requirements. Um, we have uh, two technologies, one for uh, software developers called MVD, uh, one 
uh, more applicable to uh, uh, particular projects and jurisdictions called IDS, so that information requirements can be expressed and shared, and these can help people configure the tools to make sure they deliver the information that uh, each jurisdiction expects. And we have standards for messages. Uh, one of the uh, important things about the regulatory environment is the flow of uh, comments and supplementary questions and so on um, that can arise uh, when uh, an application is reviewed in detail. And so we have a, a, an open BIM standard called BCF, which allows the regulator and the uh, applicant to have detailed conversations about particular objects uh, um, without uh, any confusion or ambiguity. So we have uh, a set of standards uh, built around uh, the IFC, which allows information about uh, project proposals to be uh, expressed unambiguously uh, and clearly. The next thing to think about then is who is pushing for open BIM in regulatory situations. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say that the Building Smart Regulatory Room is uh, leading that and has contacts around the world uh, to many, many initiatives. And I can't list them all uh, here. Um, in recent presentations, uh, we've uh, heard from the UK where my company has been working um, with government funding to demonstrate uh, the potential for um, automating the compliance checking of uh, UK building regulations, particularly those in England and Wales. Um, we've had presentations from Estonia and Portugal recently. Um, the actual list is much longer, and one of the tasks that the regulatory room is setting itself is to try and maintain uh, um, a live index of activities. Um, but today we're going to hear from Singapore and Dubai, uh, United Arab, Arab Emirates. Um, but before I hand over to our speakers, um, I, I, there's one piece of news um, that I'd like to share uh, on this call. Um, because it's only a week old. Uh, going a little bit back in time, um, it's probably about five years ago that uh, a project in Norway, um, in fact, a hydroelectric dam was announced uh, uh, as having been completely paperless. And that struck me as being a significant milestone. And even if the exact details of how it was done uh, aren't always uh, um, easy to, to get hold of. That, that was a significant milestone. And more recently, um, there's also been an announcement that a, a road project, uh, again in Norway, um, was done without drawings. Uh, that all the information was uh, held in uh, models, uh, information databases uh, and delivered to site using um, uh, mobile devices and so on and so forth. Again, um, I think the, the it's a significant transition, um, also matched by some of the processes that are being used in the UK in the construction of uh, our new or a new nuclear power station, Hinkley Point C where the process of concrete uh, foundations and re uh, reinforcement bars and so on has also gone uh, paperless and drawingless um, in order to ensure that the huge volume of uh, uh, construction uh, work uh, in the base of a nuclear power station could be carried out uh, efficiently uh, and accurately. But the news item that came out last week um, was uh, from a small town or, or region uh, called, and I will probably get this wrong, uh, Yarvanpa, um, which is 37 kilometers north of Helsinki. 
And uh, you can see in the center of the screen there, the press release, um, which of course was in Finnish, but I've translated it. Um, and the news is that uh, a, a building permit application using uh, OpenBIM, using IFC has been granted, uh, I think in this case for a single family dwelling, um, uh, with no other material being submitted uh, using only an IFC file. So uh, this claim, uh, as you can see, Thursday 27th of May, oh, 2021, well, 2022, I think, um, uh, world's first building permit submitted with a 3D BIM model um, and has been granted, which is good news. Um, and uh, again, as with the earlier claims that I've mentioned, uh, we will learn more about the detail. Um, but in some senses, it's the claim that's the important thing, that uh, uh, jurisdictions around the world are moving towards the adoption of open BIM as part of their regulatory process, uh, either optionally or making it mandatory for certain sizes of projects. And these landmark uh, uh, events um, will start to come thicker uh, and, and more frequently uh, in the time to come. So um, just an uh, um, uh, uh, interesting note, um, the, uh, the wording of the press release said the groundbreaking project required a family that was enthusiastic about information modeling uh, a professional in information modeling, an innovative permit processor, and advanced partners for construction. So to be on the leading edge at the moment, you need to get the team together. Um, but um, the message is that using them, using information modeling, the building permit inspection can then be completed in seconds. So, um, it may not, it may turn out that this wasn't the first, um, but I think uh, it's a significant landmark um, in, in, in our topic. Um, and so uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Warren Sulihan um, to talk about uh, the situation and progress in Singapore. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, uh, Nick. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, so I need... Uh, I Nick, think... I think you have to stop sharing. Yeah, you have to stop sharing. Ah, sorry, I'll do that. Just a second. <laughs> ah, apologies. I've... Stop share. Right, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen now. All right, so hopefully you see my screen. Um, yes. Uh, just give a short introduction. So, uh, so I have been involved in uh, code checking efforts uh, for very long. I know Nick for very long too. Uh, so we, we had, uh, I will go through a little bit uh, the history of what we actually have done in Singapore. And uh, I try to share as general information in relations on how these things or what kind of efforts that they actually do instead of uh, specific to the projects. But uh, there will be some references in terms of what we actually have been doing, what kind of projects that we have been doing. So I uh, hope that will be useful. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing that I would like to share is it's kind of a brief, brief history. Um, just be mindful that it, is, it may not capture everything. And I did actually this presentation in 20, probably 2016 or 2017. And I have, I have not really been updating it uh, with the latest kind of developments. What I just want to highlight is where Singapore efforts are. So we started uh, Connect e plan check in 2001. And uh, that, that effort was led by Building Construction Authority in Singapore. And I think um, this among the, the very first ones are trying to use OpenBeam 
right? So we, in that project, we bravely use IFC at the very first version that we used for that project was IFC 151. So most of you probably don't know, uh, don't, don't hear that much, but it was 151. And then we ended up with, uh, with the development, for the development of IFC, we had uh, IFC 2x2. So a lot of IFC 2x2 property sets and things like that, and some improvements I actually contributed from that project. And um, because that was actually quite early in terms of uh, the, the implementations, the main challenge at that point of time is really in the industry readiness adoptions. Right? And th that effort has been um, renewed. So in the recent years, so if you look at that in the foreground, you see that in the 2018 in Singapore, there are two uh, agencies, the government agencies in Singapore kind of initiated um, the automated code checking projects. So one is from public utility board. Um, the, the system is called BIM checking system, which is actually alive right now, uh, focusing more on um, the uh, sanitary systems, sewerage, uh, drainage systems, and uh, water systems. So they, they are, they're dealing with water and sewerage and things like that. The other systems uh, also started at the end of 2018, so it's around the same time, is uh, from Urban Redevelopment Authority that developed a slightly different uh, check in this case, is actually computing a gross flow area. And then it compares with, you know, uh, whatever is being submitted, it checks for uh, some exceptions. Um, there are complicated rules. It's probably many different countries have complicated rules in computing gross flow area. Uh, so th that, that's one of the things. And it's also being kind of used, but this is, uh, the, the PUB system is actually available to the industry directly. Uh, the URA system is mostly used uh, internally. And then in 2021, actually in the middle of uh, the pandemic, uh, there was a pilot project uh, with ConnectX. So, so this is kind of a renewed effort from uh, the, the early 2000s. The model checkers, um, again, also using OpenBeam. All these efforts are all uh, based on OpenBeam IFC. And also uh, in 2021, we also have uh, a study of basically a, a, a project looking at regulatory requirements and defining uh, what we call it MVD for regulatory requirements in Singapore. And all those efforts that I mentioned in Singapore, we are very conscious about the use of standards and therefore we have been using IFC OpenBeam since uh, early 2000. Uh, it is not always smooth, so along the way, they, there was doubt about, oh, is IFC the right tool? So I, I myself received a lot of questions about, is IFC uh, the right tool? Um, the next questions I often get from people is that, how about data loss? Uh, this question is being asked often. I'm not in other countries, but in Singapore, we, we receive a lot of questions like that. Um, so my answer usually to, to that question is, yes, definitely there's a data loss, but that is not unique to us. So for example, if you use, take an analogy, you use a Word document and then you convert it to PDF, is there any data loss? Yeah, there are a lot of data loss actually, because you cannot edit the PDF like you actually edit in Word, but that doesn't matter because that's not the, the focus that you, you actually want to do, right? So it's the same thing when we actually deal with open beam. Is there any data loss? Yes. What kind of data is lost? Does it matter? Because um, a lot of information in the beam authoring tools are actually specific only for beam authoring tools to perform uh, whatever operations within that. When it comes to uh, regulatory requirements and things like that, you don't actually need those. You really need the so-called final product of it which IFC actually captures very well. And after, after many years of developments and uh, improvements of uh, the BIM authoring to support for IFC, I would say that today uh, IFC has become uh, very solid and mature. 
uh, a lot of problems often is because people don't know how to use it or uh, they, they don't know how to ex what to expect with IFC. So um, the OpenBeam IFC governs the data format and the agreed content. And uh, we usually have to go through the exchange requirements basically by, by probably disciplines or certain areas because there are many different parts of even regulatory codes that you need to look at. And then um, there are other standards that have to be considered. So as part of the open beam still, uh, Nick's probably already mentioned earlier about local uh, standards, about uh, development of uh, model view definitions. It's basically defining a subset of the IFC schema and more details requirements about what should be inside there, the content of it, and so on. So one of the projects that we actually uh, uh, also do in Singapore is actually looking at uh, various regulatory requirements for multiple agencies, around 54 uh, documents, uh, code of practices that covering architecture, building services, structural, uh, external works, as well as something to do with uh, uh, some urban uh, design, but it's not the urban design part, but it's related to it. Um, <clears throat> So we look at those things, we try to define, to look at what exactly are the requirements, what the standard IFC contains. And obviously a lot of times uh, they are specific requirements that uh, the standards uh, doesn't have. And we extend that requirements using the standards and mechanisms that's already provided in IFC by adding property sets and uh, things like that, right? So. Essentially, we use uh, as much standards that we have, we add within the uh, standard context that um, we can. And uh, beside that, we also obviously working on the modeling standard. So when we talk about modeling standards, so IFC defines the format, certain content, but then we also need to agree within that usage in, in, in Singapore, for example, how things should be modeled. Um, when we talk about walls, it's probably everyone understands that yes, wall is modeled this way. But when we talk about some uh, more specific things, like for example, curbs, you know, the, the roadside curbs, how are you going to model that? And sometimes inside the house, you have also curbs for, let's say, toilet curbs. How do you model that? Um, you know, are we using slabs? Are you using wall? And there, are, there are many details that actually have to go through when agreed and saying, okay, this is how things should be modeled this kind of information should be there and what should not be done certain way because uh, you know right now without standards people can do all kinds of things like for example uh, a classic in uh, the, the usage that we actually have seen is that um, we have seen uh, people model a uh, staircase using beam beam tool we have seen railings being modeled using uh, case works we have seen a uh, tabletop uh, model using uh, slab because you want to have a hole and things like that. It's uh, easy to do that, or walls. So there are, there are misuse of it. Um, and so, so we have to deal with that in the modeling standards. Even let's say certain tools are being used, at least we have to have an agreement that it has to be exported correctly. Um, and also, uh, again, like Nick mentioned, there are other standards like uh, Omniclass, Uniclass, or even uh, building smart uh, data dictionary, BCF, and also BIM and GIS integration. Those are important components that need to be standardized. And that is kind of, a, we, we look at them and we consider them. And um, a little bit more into what we actually do when we talk about implementations of those regulatory rules. Basically we have, a, we follow roughly this kind of uh, high level steps. First, we analyze the, the rules. Um, we, we have a dedicated people to do that rule analysis. They will have to work with the rule owners to understand why do you do this? Why do you need this? You know, How do you compute certain things or how do you uh, check certain things? And also industry consultant to tell, yeah, usually this is how we do it, you know, uh, and so on. And the results of it usually is split into two. Uh, one is that you have the exchange requirements and then further on into a model view definitions that will lead into information manuals that will go to um, 
uh, as a source for modeling guidelines, uh, as well as as input for BIM authoring tools to support that particular MVD. So what we have done in Singapore is that we are not trying to create a new standards. We use uh, IFC4 preference view. Uh, that is being, uh, that multiple uh, tools are uh, being certified or already certified right now. We add uh, the standards uh, way of extending with the uh, uh, property sets, for example. So it's almost immediately that we get uh, authoring tools uh, to be able to support the requirements, even though there are some hiccups in there, but those are minor hiccups. And then uh, parallel to that, uh, from the analysis of the rules, we actually look at the checking root logics and then specify what exactly is uh, being checked and how that is being checked. That will lead into a coding or scripting of that rules. And so industry users, we have the, we, we get the modeling guide, guidelines. You use a compliant tool, generate the right models and so that uh, the code uh, or the scripts can actually be performed to the standard models. So it's simple, simple guidelines, a uh, simple uh, process, but I think is important because each of them uh, requires a different uh, people involved, requires the specifications and so on. So that, that's what we generally have been following. This is just a snapshot of examples. For example, MVD specifications, it, it may come up with a spreadsheet like this. And that information manual is more, uh, at least more readable, is more uh, uh, organized in such way. And then modeling guidelines is more than that. It involves uh, uh, illustrations for some, okay, how do you model it? How do you, you know, put certain things and, and so on. And so I just want to highlight again the importance of standards because uh, when we actually use standards, uh, something that we, we all have to kind of remember, uh, one is that the standards must be widely adopted, meaning that everybody must believe in it and everybody use it. And I think OpenBeam uh, IFC has gone a long way and now gaining more uh, confidence in terms of uh, different countries and different tools and so on. And it has to be relevant to industries, uh, but this needs some education. So this is one of the, the big challenges actually. We uh, talk a, a little bit about this later. Uh, standards have to be clear and um, in, uh, unambiguous. And some ways we have to be able to validate or certify uh, because we can define the requirements. And then if we have no way to validate, that's not going to help. So the definitions of MVDs, for example, will actually help so that we can actually do uh, automatic validations of the content of the model. That's the first step of, to ensure that the data is good. Uh, when we come to implementation of code checking, you actually have various uh, aspects that you need to consider. So this is uh, the old um, kind of uh, diagrams. Uh, some may actually have seen it in some papers. Um, forget about the details inside. Uh, we just basically wants to highlight that we need to look at from both angles, from the rules and the regulations itself, as well as the data. So um, these two need to be in harmony because otherwise uh, you will have some something broken in between, right? So these whole things have to be all there at the same time to be able to get everything to work. Um, these are the, the very simple uh, diagram to show that all stakeholders must be involved. So starting from the rule owners, uh, we, we have to identify the needs of each of these stakeholders. For the rule owners, usually the problem is about technology saviness. Now in, in, in part of other countries, maybe you, you have a very good uh, or technology savvy uh, of, uh, officers. Uh, in Singapore, we, we are not that savvy, especially the older generations. And with the paradigm shift from 2D thinking to models, uh, they really, uh, some, some of them really struggle. So this has to be prepared if you want to be successful. And then from the AEC industry, uh, BIM readiness is important. Uh, even though we have a lot of adoptions on BIM and all those things, but 2D is still very prevalent in the world today. Uh, adopting standards. So again, without standards, it will be very difficult to achieve anything. So the, the standards is important. 
and care about the data. Now, uh, why I say this, and I uh, put a upper case on the data, is because up to today, most people care about presentation, how things look. They care less about the data. So that has to change because not only the models uh, looks good, it needs to contain the correct and good uh, information. And to do that, you may have to retrain the workforce. Um, <clears throat> for BIM authoring tools, again, also it's important because it has to support the, the relevant MVD. In Singapore, we are very uh, blessed because major authoring tools that we actually work with are very supportive. So we work with them. They are very willing to improve their, their software to support. Um, ease of use is very important. The good quality and uh, documentation is very important. And IFC is a little bit too complicated for many people. Um, for technology providers like my company who are actually working on implementations, uh, domain knowledge need to be really good. Uh, development strategy need to be good. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to implement uh, big numbers of rules that have to be implemented, for example. We use uh, agile methods really to, to manage the risk. Um, Cloud-based technology will also be very useful. Uh, because now uh, you know it's, it's easier to to, uh, to deploy and to maintain things like that. Uh, the the kind of the last part that I want to just highlight is um, there are challenge challenges. Uh, even though in Singapore we have tried uh, for a long time, uh, challenges still persist. And sometimes we have this. I mean, often we actually look at the the three kind of pull factors here, right? So I try to describe it this way. Um, there are three things that uh, we usually look at. One is that uh, computational complexity, how so-called software need to be able to do uh, uh, to support the uh, automated code checking. The second one is the modeling efforts. So how much things that the modelers have to put in, all right? And then the, the third one, Unfortunately, I cannot get a better uh, descriptions, but the, the arrow is slightly, you know, the other way around. It's about rule comprehensiveness or increasing comprehensiveness is going into that. So it means a less comprehensive uh, when the arrow goes out. Um, so if if we focus on uh, the the rule being less comprehensive but easy, so that's actually low modeling effort. If you see that the diagram, low modeling efforts low complexity in, terms of, in term of implementations, you get the uh, generally low comprehensiveness. You cannot do a lot of more comprehensive check or sophisticated, sophisticated check. Um, on the other hand, if we say that, okay, you have to model all this information. In fact, uh, the example that, that I give you, uh, maybe I will go back one just to, to look at. This is an example of, for example, parking lot dimensions, requirements, and uh, or locations. So you can make it simple saying that, okay, you have to model individually, you have to put the dimensions and so on. So you, the, the checkers will just check whatever the information say that in the properties, that will be very easy to do. Uh, if we want to increase the complexity uh, of checking, uh, often, the modeling efforts increases. So for example, if you have to model the, the escape path by using certain geometry and they have to be all over the, the, the models, that will be increasing a lot of modeling efforts, but that will actually increase the comprehensiveness. Still in terms of, comput of computational complexity is lower. And then if you actually pull that towards uh, some compromise here, that means you want to have uh, rules to be very complex, uh, comprehensive, and then you want to have uh, less modeling efforts, then the computational complexity will actually go up. So an example that is given here is, for example, how to compute certain things. So you have to have uh, uh, some kind of a geometric engine to do that and things like that. But this is the, the, the kind of approach or stance that we take in Singapore. We try to minimize the modeling efforts and yet we want to be as comprehensive possible, which means that the computational complexity increases. Okay, so I think generally, um, whoever that actually think about this, this kind of simple diagram will help. Um, 
and uh, certain adjustment may be slightly different for different countries, but in the end, uh, really the interest on the usefulness of automated code checking can come only when it is comprehensive, it less modeling efforts, and yet they can actually do a very good check. So that, that's kind of experience that we have in, in Singapore. And uh, yeah, so this is what uh, kind of uh, what I have already mentioned in, the, in terms of conclusions. So we can use indirect information. For example, uh, we want to know uh, parking aisles and you know, how do you actually know with parking aisles or whether there's any, you know, two directions or one direction without having a very specialized modeling, you know, here, you know, this is lane one, and this is lane two, which direction. We actually find out that very often the, the arrows are actually modeled. So that, that we, we ask ourselves a question, okay, maybe we can use that arrows to indicate whether it's one way or two ways, whether it's actually, you know, um, it's other information that we can use without really other explicit modeling, meaning the model is already, already having that information. So we can make use of that for various purposes, including uh, checking uh, directions uh, uh, or width or other things that is required, so usually related to car parks or other things related to it. So this is just a, a brief example that I have. Uh, I think that's all I have in uh, that I can share today. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask me later or yeah, I will try to answer as much as I can. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. And uh, uh, um, lo lots of, share. yeah, lo lots of very interesting details. And we're grateful for, for that. And the determination that Singapore is showing to um, make progress. Um, so that's exciting. Um, now, uh, going to move on and ask Dr. Ibrahim further uh, to update us about the work that's been happening in the UAE. Um, All right. Thanks, thanks yeah. Nick. Um, I'll share my screen now. Uh, OK. Let's do. Share. OK. Uh, I hope you see my screen. Yes. All right, that's great. Yes. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome to my part of the presentation today. Um, I'm I'm really glad to present today's. Uh, it's maybe my first presentation on building smart. Um, today, I think my presentation. I hope my presentation will fit with the uh, theme of our meeting today. Um, today, I present uh, some work we have done here in Dubai municipality, and more specifically. Uh, a digital surface uh, to be used or can be used by uh, the building uh, permit applicants. Uh, currently, it can be used by anyone, but ultimately, eventually, it should be or can be used by the uh, building uh, permit applicants who are applying to obtain building permits. Uh, the name of the surface, the digital surface, currently is named BIM eSubmission Platform. And that will be my focus uh, of uh, today's presentation. Um, being aware of time, I will keep things high level. Uh, we're not going to go into much details uh, of the platform, just give an overall view of the platform. Um, just a quick uh, introduction about myself. I have a civil engineering background, but over the years, uh, I really worked on um, di using digital technology in the construction industry. So I have hands-on experience developing uh, in, in, in plain term, really, uh, software in the construction industry. Um, recently, I have moved to Dubai Municipality as BIM expert, uh, moved from the UK, and uh, um, I'm working now uh, in Dubai Municipality as, as BIM expert, as I said. Um, for the agenda for today, I keep it short, as I said. So first, I will introduce the uh, vision here in Dubai Municipality. So I'll just give you overall view uh, of what, what they think or what we think in terms of uh, moving to digital construction. And then I move to the focus of the presentation of uh, today uh, and talk about uh, in more details on the uh, BIM submission platforms. 
Um, and we end up uh, end the presentation with uh, a kind of a summary, really, really and uh, some some kind of uh, um, key points of the presentation. So let me start first with the vision here in Dubai municipality. Uh, it's always good to start with the vision because that paved uh, the way for any uh, implementation uh, of, of digital services um, to serve the, the sector. So the vision here in Dubai municipality is really to create what we call the uh, ideal digital construction ecosystem for Dubai. And that means basically having a set of uh, digital services that link together to achieve the ultimate goal as, as producing um, an ecosystem, digital ecosystem for construction industry. And usually to achieve the vision for any digital service, the, the R process is followed basically. And the process um, consists of three main activities. So the first step, uh, creating any digital service for the construction industry here in Dubai municipality is to standardize first the process, to standardize the workflow, the requirement of the service. That's the first step. And the next step is moving to the implementation of the, uh, the service itself. That's creating the uh, digital, the implementation of the service. And once the service is up and running, uh, it can be integrated with other existing services to perform or make the ecosystem uh, for, for the whole municipality. So this is kind of the three main activities when creating uh, a digital service. Um, and that's kind of the overall vision. And now moving a bit uh, to specifically talk about PIM. Um, there has been uh, some work on developing uh, BIM roadmap here in, in Dubai municipality, being aware of the benefits of BIM and all the benefits can bring to the uh, construction industry. So they, they a the work started in 2020 on this roadmap and it will span over many years until uh, around 2023 or four. In terms of BIM, as I said, there are um, three actions creating any uh, digital service here. So the first step is, or the first action is standardize the the, uh, the the surface, if you want, or standardize the workflow, the requirements. And that me, mean in the context of BIM is producing um, a unified, if you want, uh, regulation or standard and currently that is, a, is, is done as a first step. And there is something called BIM standard, local BIM standard for Dubai. Um, so the first step is achieved. Uh, the next action in creating the uh, digital surface is digitalize the, the, uh, the, the, the standards in a way, which means developing the digital surface. Again, in the context of BIM that have been translated to create uh, what is called now is the BIM e-submission platform to be used by uh, building permit applicants. And this currently um, uh, mature development. And the following step, which is an undergoing process, is integrating the, uh, the, the e-submission platform with other services here in Dubai municipality. For example, integrating the submission platform with GIS services, integrating the platform with a new under development uh, building permit ab application or service. Now, uh, as I said, the focus of today's presentation is more on the submission platform. And uh, as I said, we have currently achieved uh, the or developed the, uh, the BIM standard here for Dubai, uh, and which kind of aligned with ISO uh, 1965. In terms of the platform, the e-submission platform, if, if we look uh, at the platform uh, from a macro view, really, from far away, it's really provide the end user with the three main functionalities at the moment. There are, of course, more than that, but the main, main uh, functionalities or features of the platform is allows the user to use and upload IFC models uh, to the platform and then run automated compliance check against uh, the local BIM standards and the building uh, code rules. It also allows the user to view the model 
and inspect the model visually using a 3D online viewer. Um, and optionally, optionally, the end user, if they decide, they can submit the model to be reviewed by the uh, Dubai Municipality Permitting Engineers. And if there are any issues, they can communicate back and forth between the end user and the engineers to resolve all these issues. And the issues can be uh, communicated using BCF uh, format, which again, it's an open startup format. So this is the main kind of broadly main features in the platform. Um, if I break down the platform to separate modules now, if we look at the implementation of the uh, platform, of, again, from high level implementation, what the, are the main modules in the platform? And I believe really, I think this is what this are uh, typical modules will you, you, you will find in any submission or similar platform. So starting from the left side, um, you have the user interface. So of course, this platform require a user interface and the interface currently it's a web online user interface. So the user can go to the browser and uh, access the interface um, of the platform from a web browser. So that's the first module. Um, the second module is the registration module. Bef before it's a user management uh, system or service, uh, so you need user account. So you need some way to register user. So for that reason, registration modules is required to allow the user to access their own accounts. Um, in the middle, you see we, we have a 3D BIM viewer. So that's another module. Uh, the purpose of this viewer to allow the end user to, to visualize their models, the uploaded models, and inspect the model. And below that, we have also in the back end of the platform uh, is the IFC parser. And the purpose of this module is to take the IFC file and extract data out of the IFC file. For example, all geometric data required when it comes to checking the rules, we need to know the geometry, more geometry information about the uh, objects inside the file. So there's a parser job to process the IFC file. Um, also, we have the rules engines. And so the rule engine uh, job is basically to take the rules defined uh, and uh, check the model against these rules. Uh, below that, we have the uh, also uh, notification modules the purpose of the notification modules is to allow the two sides of the uh, of the if you want the uh, the platform the uh, the end user and the permitting engineer maybe to exchange uh, messages and being notified whenever messages are raised so that's also a requirement uh, for the uh, e submission platform at the far end of the platform on the server you have the, of course, a data storage and the data storage uh, store the uploaded files by the user in, um, in different format, but more specifically the IFC format and the issues are stored in uh, PSF formats. And the last module also as part of the uh, platform uh, uh, components is the, the BIM GIS integration. So there is also a module developed uh, that facilitate the the integration between BIM and GIS services here in Dubai Municipality. So this is uh, the overall view of the existing modules inside the platforms. Of course, these modules work together to make the platform. Now, in terms of the how the platform can be used, there are two scenarios now planned for the platforms. The first scenario, which is the platform itself is a standalone platform, which mean can be accessed directly from the web browser uh, using the link you see on this slide. Um, so the user, they can go to the web browser, type the link and log in and use the surface. That's the standalone mode. Uh, and it's currently available publicly. So anyone can go there and uh, check the surface and provide feedback. The other mode, which is under development, is to utilize the functionality of the platform in another surface. So this is what I talked about, integration, integration of surfaces. So the vision is to not only use the platform as a standalone, but use the functionality of the platform in other surfaces, which also under development. And the surface I'm talking about is 
building permit surface where the uh, building permit applicants log to the building permit surface itself and apply for building permits but as part of their application they can access the functionality provided by the BIM e-submission platform from within the building permit surface. That is still a work in progress. It's under development. Hopefully it will be completed sometime this year. So this is the two uh, modes or scenario the platform functionality can be used at the moment. Now we're looking at the workflow of the e-submission, how you work within the e-submission platform. It, it, it's, it's, it's quite a typical process for any submission application, submission platform, uh, basically. So you start with the registration. So you need to register on the platform, get an account. Once you have an account, then you can log in and create a new project. Once the project uh, is created, you can start uploading your IFC file and the model data. And then you move to the third step, which is basically the step uh, you, you spend most of your time on this step is where you inspect your model, you view your model, run the uh, automated compliance check on your model. So to see if there is any issue. So that, that's the, the focal point of the, the platform or the main activity in the platform or the most time spent on the platform. It allows you to view, view different uh, things uh, and extract information at the same time. Um, the last two steps is optional, basically. So at the moment, you can use the surface uh, or the submission platform uh, for self-checking. So you don't have to submit anything. So you can upload file, run all the compliance check, visualize the model, see if there's any issue, and stop there. You don't have to submit. But optionally, you can submit, submit the, the, the models to be reviewed by the uh, permitting engineer. And in that case, you have you have two actors in the process. Um, the, on the left side, you have the end user, or could be the consultant or the contractor or any anyone on behalf applying for the permit. They will create the project, upload the models, review their models, and so on, and optionally submit. If they decide to submit the application, on the other side, on the right side, the uh, the uh, permitting engineer they will receive or get notified of a new application. And uh, then they start their own review. And if they find any issue with the, with the uh, application or the models, they communicate these issues back and forth with the, uh, with the applicants using the BCF format and using the platform itself um, until at some point, hopefully all the issues are resolved and the uh, permitting engineer approve the application. So this is the typical workflow currently can be followed in the uh, platform. Now, if we if we talk about maturity level, I guess this is important uh, uh, to say something about maturity level. Uh, the, the platform is, is 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 really beyond proof of concept. So it's moved that stage where you say it's a proof of concept. Um, so it's quite mature. Um, most features in the surface uh, or the platform uh, are mature. Uh, of course, like any digital surface, there is, there is uh, always room for improvement uh, to enhance functionality, increase functionality. Um, for example, uh, bursting the IFC files uh, at the moment maybe is, is good, but I think it can be improved to Im to work with larger files. So if you have a large IFC file, it might take some time to process the file. So there are things we can do to improve the performance. Uh, on the 3D viewer, for example, I think there are also room for improvement to improve the performance, to allow more visual, uh, visual features to inspect the model quickly. So there are room for improvement. I hope, uh, and, and, and the plan, there's a plan to work on it uh, based on internal uh, assessment and based on uh, feedback uh, we receive from the end user. I, because I'm aware of time, I I didn't plan to do a presentation today really for for the the, the platform. But what I did instead, I kind of I took up an online uh, training video or demo on the platform, and I compacted that in in a one minute 
demo just to take you just to for you to get the feel and look how the platform look and feel from the end user perspective so it will be a one minute not um, really a, a serious demo here just to give you uh, a feel what it it looks in terms of a user interface so um this is a short demo so you log in this is the main uh, landing page of the platform as I said, the first step is uh, registration. So you fill in um, some details to create your account. When it's successful, you have now your uh, own account. Then you log in and start creating projects. So you create a new project and fill in the details of the project. You go through the wizard. Once the project created, you can start uh, uploading files, the IFC file or the models. Um, in that case, it's uploaded to the models will be parsed and processed. Once the model are available, uh, you can start viewing them in the 3D viewer. So you go to the viewer again on the platform and visualize the model. Then you can run the compliance check. Once you have uh, the model uploaded, you click on a button called run a compliance check. When it's completed, you have a chance to view the results. Again, you can see the uh, result on the screen in the uh, viewer itself. Also, you can see the uh, the building location on a map and see the building card of the uh, building. Also, um, when if you decide to submit, you can uh, communicate uh, any any issue with the model with the permitting engineer. So you have the the platform to allow you to communicate uh, the issues, as I said, in using VCF format. And once the whole thing is completed and the issues resolved. Uh, and in case you submit uh, the application to the permitting engineer, you get your application approved and that's the end of the process. So uh, this is a very, very short, compact demo, uh, as, uh, as I said. But if you wish um, to see a full demo uh, in more depth, really, you have two options. Um, on the left side, you have uh, uh, you can access the uh, existing demo on the platform itself using the link shown on this slide. There are more than training demos, but you can see the, the demos about the platform, the platform itself there. Also, Dr. Ali Ismail recently gave a presentation about the platform uh, on building smart. You can scan the code on the right side also to find the uh, presentation uh, and Dr. Ali demoed the platform uh, during that presentation. Now, as for summary, really just share kind of uh, conclusions or share uh, main key points of, uh, of the development here in Dubai Municipality uh, and, and more specifically about BIM e submission platform. So I, I want to say, emphasize something here that the platform itself at its heart rely on open standard, open BIM standards, uh, IFC and BCFI. So those are the two main standards to communicate uh, the models and the issues within the models. Um, in terms of the maturity levels, uh, as I said, the platform now quite mature. There are still work to be done, but it's quite mature and there's plan to use the functionality of the platform itself in other surfaces. And that lead me to the integration uh, point there. So there's a plan to use the uh, platform, uh, to integrate the platform uh, functionality with the GIS surfaces and also with the uh, under development uh, building permit application. In terms of documentation, uh, if you log in to the platform, if you, if you go to the landing page of the platform, you will see uh, various documentation available for you to give you kind of a startup basically um, to use the platform. So you'll find there the BIM standards, Dubai BIM standard, you'll find the building code, you'll find some guidelines to use the platform and demos um, and templates to use with authoring uh, design, uh, authoring software, to, uh, to model uh, buildings. Uh, so you can, there are templates for Revit and Bentley, um, just to just so that when you export your model from the authoring tools, you, you produce a, a good quality IFC file that is compatible with the platform uh, uh, quality control rules. 
Um, in terms of the challenges, yes, there are challenges and there are technical and non-technical challenges. Uh, in terms of technical challenges, it's, as I said, for example, uh, anything related to uh, software development, um, I consider that as a technical challenges. Um, as I said, for example, improving the performance of the parcel is a challenge. Uh, working on the 3D viewer, ma making it more intuitive is a challenge, but also all this doable. It just takes time, but it's, it's, it's doable. There are non-technical challenges, for example, is educating people to accept the tool as part of their daily business, awareness about the benefits of using BIM, a submission platforms. Um, all of this is, is non-technical challenges, and, and at some time, or really, at times, uh, the non-technical non challenges are more difficult uh, to overcome than the technical challenges. But we are also working here to increase the awareness of the benefit of being uh, via seminars, webinars, uh, and various ways to educate uh, uh, the public about the benefit of, of using Open BIM in general and the, the, the platform for uh, building permit application. For the release date, um, the, the, the platform now is available publicly. So uh, anyone can now go to the platform uh, and really register and start using the platform. And uh, they can feed back any issues they find uh, in the platform back to us. And we can work on it. Uh, but I heard that uh, officially, um, it will be announced later this year. So it will move from testing feedback mode to more put in use mode, basically. So it become like part of the workflow of applying for building permits. So we put, the plan is to do this sometime this year. Um, if you have any question, please reach out to Dr. Ismail. He is the project manager, uh, and he looked after the development of the uh, BIM e-submission platform. And also, equally, you, I'm happy uh, I'm happy to answer your question if I can. So also, please reach out if you have any question. Um, that's all from me. Uh, so I hope you find. Uh, this information is useful and uh, now you know more about the platform here in Dubai Municipality and I encourage you all to register and give it a go and let us know what you think of it. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, Let me um, just reshare our slide stack. Um, I think we've had two very interesting presentations about um, the uh, confirming that, that this is underway, which was our primary message, and uh, being uh, honest about um, the uh, issues that come along with getting this done. Um, there have been a few questions on the chat, um, mostly about technical details about um, how the implementation is going um, in, in um, the CoreNet initiative. Uh, and I think the, uh, there are some good answers already in there, so that's nice. And a, a web link if you want to know more. Um, I would really like to hear from the audience. Um, of course, if there are further questions about the presentations, that's great. Um, I'd really like to hear um, all those niggling butts that are in people's minds that are saying, yes, that's fine there in Singapore, in Finland, in Dubai, but not here or not in my sector or not in my um, jurisdiction or whatever. Um, so I'd really like to hear what the challenge questions are going through your minds. Uh, we may not be able to answer them, uh, but it would be really good if people shared um, alongside any other positive uh, um, stories. Um, you know, what are those challenge questions in people's minds? Okay. Um, meanwhile, whilst we wait for those to come through, um, I'd like to ask 
um, both our speakers. Um, uh, uh, how you go about educating um, the audience? Um, how, how do you get acceptance of uh, what you've been trying to do? Um, well, on, any, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I will divide into two, right? One is the government agencies, definitely they are the one, the, the less efforts to educate them since they are the one taking initiative, but there are two parts of, of it, as I mentioned, the regulatory approval, uh, process is done by officers who are less savvy in terms of technologies that so you, you need to help them uh, educating them uh, on the knowledge yeah. of beam as well yeah. and for the industry it's kind of a, a slightly different challenge in Singapore especially there are a lot of them know how to use beam tool but there is no good uh, standardizations in terms of how uh, things should be done so uh, we need to to go beyond the just using BIM, but uh, to awareness of how the data should be, uh, you know, they should care about the data. So the few things that we actually do, uh, we work with uh, agencies like BCA to give uh, some trainings, even BCA themselves actually do a, a lot of seminars. Um, I uh, also teach uh, part-time in some of the universities and uh, national university in Singapore and building BCA Academy, where I actually bring the, the awareness of IFC. Uh, not too much at the moment, but there are some efforts within the Building Smarts as well as uh, collaboration with BCA and uh, other institutes of higher learning to bring uh, IFC competency uh, to be more, uh, to, to improve it in the industry. So, yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Yes, uh, I can maybe add one one more point. I think in my view, it's a start from the university, uh, from the student themselves. So if there is a way to bring a build a bridge with the university, so we bring the awareness starting from the student themselves, from the university. So when they are graduated, they know the benefits already. They don't have to learn it while they are working because then they will be busy doing day to day work. So it's best to start at the root of it when they are studying and train them there of the benefits. So when they are in the market, they can they are already aware of the benefits of open open standards. So that's the additional point I'd, I'd like, uh, I wanted to add to uh, what one and add as as way to increase the awareness. Yeah. Yes, I think in the UK we have a, a different problem. We have a very high awareness of BIM going back um, perhaps 40 years. Um, so people who, who learnt BIM on very large computers are now um, in, in positions of influence in the industry. Um, but it's much harder to get to the um, regulators and the policy makers. Um, and we've uh, a note here, um, well, a couple of questions. Um, will Dubai start with digital permitting for a specific type of commercial or residential projects, for example? So when you go live, um, will it be for all building types? Um, I cannot answer this for definite, but I, what I heard that it will be a gradual process. So at the start, you support certain type of buildings i'm not sure what type really but i don't think the plan will go live with all types of building that will be challenging so it might start with maybe uh, some type a type or, or uh, more i don't know but not all types uh, okay uh, and yeah. frank doherty from uh, scotland has um remarked that um, the government is intent on, uh, the Scottish government is intent on using technology to improve lives and business um, and innovation. Um, but uh, the challenge is a business case. Um, have you, uh, either of you had to make a business case in terms of financial and other benefits? 
or anything you can say about that? <laughs> uh, I think we, we do have the same questions all the time from the industry. So they, they are generally skeptical, saying, well, okay, this uh, automatic code checking sounds good, but it is for the authority's benefit. So always our benefit. Um, and then and the next concern they have is uh, the amount of extra modeling efforts that they, they need to do. Um, yeah, we, we don't have a very good uh, answers to all this because uh, I don't think we do have a very good uh, a study in terms of uh, you know, how much money being saved and all those things besides those general knowledge that we all know. Uh, with good models, things will be better, but there is no clear quantifiable uh, numbers at the moment. Uh, but the, the one, one of the things that uh, I usually try to help in terms of uh, arguments is that, well, what we try to do is that whatever that you have modeled today, that's pretty much what uh, you need to do, except that maybe uh, there's some certain adjustment. That means maybe certain naming now need, need to be standardized. Maybe certain things you should do, certain things you should not do, but the amount of information that have to be inserted into the model is pretty much the same as what they have to do. And probably some of them are actually in 2D forms today for the seats and you, you know put annotations, put uh, certain other information about materials or other things. So we, we, we try to minimize from the perspective that, okay, if you have to do it in 2D, there's no reason why you cannot do it in 3D, uh, things like that. But uh, definitely uh, there, there will be some, some business cases, but uh, probably uh, won't be so early. Uh, in ConnectX, for example, the, the efforts is now more uh, unified in, this, in a sense compared to in, in the past, because uh, now the, the, the government is focused more on data as well as they want the industry or they want to kind of uh, provide the platform so the industry can do a coordination early. Uh, so not only that approvals will be smoother, but also they will benefit from a good quality model. Yeah. Dr. Ibrahim, anything you'd yeah, add? Yeah, I, yes, I think as a, as a strong business case is, is the benefit of reducing the time to obtain the permit itself. So you'll cut time to obtain the permits. So, so it's not just extra time at your end as a, as a consultant to building the 3D model, but when you apply for the permit itself, there is a lot of things will be done automatically for you. The checking, um, filling in, for example, the building cards currently, it's a manual process, it's a very tedious manual process. It takes hours to fill manually the building cards, especially for large buildings. And the idea now is if you have an IFC model, you can automatically generate the building card from the model itself. Of course, that will save a lot of time uh, filling in this information manually. And not only filling it manually, it increases the accuracy because you might, while you're typing things manually, you might type out the area, certain area incorrectly. So that will increase the accuracy, cut time. So eventually the return of investment, it does exist. Uh, it just need, I, I guess we need to bring these benefits closely to the end user, the client, and show them they are business case. They are a case that you make, uh, you'll, you'll benefit from, from this technology. It's not just for fancy, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> implementation yeah. really so there are real benefits so yeah that that's that's uh, what i think there are tangible benefits there yeah um the building smart regulatory room has published a report um on the uh, network of benefits um not necessarily the financial benefits but the network of of benefits that flow through an automated compliance checking system um and uh, I should point to that in answer to the question as well. Um, I think the, um, the, the it is a challenging question as to um, the benefits to the clients of that time saving. Um, I think many client bodies have got used to uh, that uh, six or eight week or 10 week delay. Um, the International Finance Corporation has published the length of time it takes to get permission for a, a building in different jurisdictions. 
Um, and um, that is clearly a factor that is affecting international investment. Um, that's what the uh, the I the International Finance Corporation is is interested in. Um, so uh, I think the business case does fall. The, there are benefits on both sides of it, and of course, to to complain about uh, extra modelling um, is to risk uh, admitting that they didn't uh, didn't do the modelling properly or they didn't do the design properly in the first place. So it's it, it's challenging. To, to get the right level of honesty um, in these discussions. Um, I think we've got time for one more, um, uh, for one more question that's come through. Um, have we any tips um, for changing the process and to relearn modeling, not just for visualization, but producing the relevant data uh, for regulators? Um, again, um, let me start by saying that the, um, the regulatory room is starting to develop a report uh, guidance for regulators on the use of open BIM. Uh, but in the past, we've talked about the three stages, really, um, that uh, um, uh, the first stage, the regulators can accept uh, open BIM uh, models. Uh, simply for viewing, for orientating their teams before they get into the business of uh, checking compliance. Um, and in some countries, uh, that's also seen as a democratic um, or a, a more open way of presenting building designs, uh, making it more accessible to the public. Then there's a second step where you might use the model um, uh, to measure or to ask questions or report uh, so interact with the model to get the information that regulators typically need, um, like measuring escape distances, no doubt, um, or the sizes of openings, etc. And then only really when a regulator is competent and comfortable with those two, um, can you really start to think about then saying, well, actually, uh, we can automate uh, some or all of the checks. Um, and uh, some of you will know that I've been working on tools to make sure that the comprehensiveness is uh, is achievable um, uh, to, to, to make try and make sure that automatic checks cover uh, all the requirements uh, even those pesky ones like uh, unless uh, you know don't do this unless approved by the inspector and that kind of thing um, so uh, Last question then, I think, um, well, anything you, you'd say about uh, the change process uh, within regulators? Regulators? Um, well, I think it's important really to prepare them. I think one of the fear that sometimes people have is, okay, will that take away my job? Um, certainly not. So, um, one of the one of the dirty secrets about the, the ease of doing business, how long the permit can be approved. Right? Singapore have I think twenty six days. Uh, it's one of the one of the good ones, but we are not the best. There are some people who can actually approve in seven days. But what does that mean? Um, so you can actually don't check and make sure that you declare that you actually fulfill everything in one day. You can approve, right? uh, but that's not the point. Um, the so so the what we have been saying is that um, if we can automate, actually, it's not going to take away your job. It will actually make two things. One, uh, today you cannot check comprehensive or the, uh, complete because you just simply you don't have enough time to do that. You don't have enough resources. By doing automations, take away all the mundane check uh, away from you, this one. Two, it gets more complete because it can actually go through a lot more uh, rules than if you have to do it manually. And then you can focus on challenging uh, issues because architects always want to be different, right? So they can come up with all kinds of strange things, which the system will not be able to handle 100% of all those things. So uh, the, actually, the, the 
the regulators will actually be more, to me, probably it's more meaningful. Uh, they will have more meaningful job because they will be looking at more com complex uh, situations to handle rather than the mundane ones. Yeah. And, and, and so preparing them, I think, is important. So once they see that, I think it, it will be a lot easier. Yeah. When I was working in the USA, many of the uh, uh, authorities, the building inspectors, believed that their job was on the building site, inspecting the physical work. Mm. Um, and uh, they felt that the plan checking that they had to do um, was, as you say, uh, tedious, um, and not really using their their knowledge and experience to the best effect. So it's an interesting balance. Um, Dr. Ibrahim, um, any any thoughts about um, uh, how you get regulators to to engage with um, this possibility, these possibilities? Well, I, I think you're referring to the answer. Have have you any tips for changing the process? Is that the yeah. question? Uh, well, my understanding for the question correct is is talking about the end user, the company themselves, oh, how okay. they can. Yeah. That's my understanding. You're you're, you're right. It's like yes. how? Yes. Yeah, that's my understanding. That like how they can start picking up the process. And if I'm correct uh, in my understanding, I will say, well, there there need there there will there is a need from any company and. To invest, invest some time and resources internally to educate themselves, so they can allocate some resources um, to start learning the new way. Let's call it the new way. And I'm sure there will be upfront cost in the short term that maybe cost them time and money to educate the staff or the team themselves. But in the long run, they will find the return of investment. The, the benefit in the long run, it will become apparent. So it needs some delegation, it needs some investment. It seems like allocating resources uh, to investigate these new ways to learn it and to distribute the knowledge that part of the team learn to the rest of the team, share their knowledge. And that will be upfront in the short term, there will be additional costs, but as I said, then the long term, they will see the tangible benefits of the new way which ultimately they have to, it's not a choice. I think ultimately it, it will happen sooner or later. We know this, uh, we, we try to avoid certain technology, but eventually became part of our life and we had to use it every day. So I guess IFC <laughs> or 3D modeling, it will be, it will be must have knowledge. Yeah. As, 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 as I'm aware of in the UK, for example, all the students in the engineering, civil engineering university, they learn BIM now uh, as part of their course uh, learning uh, uh, learning program. So we, we ultimately it will be uh, what uh, the consultant uh, need to provide to the regulatory as, yeah. as part of their submission. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we're a few minutes over time. Um, but thank you. Um, I think, in conclusion, um, you know, we we would like to uh, hear more about your challenges, uh, addressing the audience more widely. You know, challenge your boss, challenge your customers, challenge your regulators about the possibilities. Um, tell us what you need to make that case, um, and uh, if you want to, please do join in. Um, we have a very simple email address, uh, regulatory at buildingsmart.org. Um, and we also have a forum, um, uh, which you can see the website on there. And there is a section for the regulatory uh, room and its activities. Uh, thank you to our speakers um, for, for being uh, so clear and so uh, comprehensive. And... Um, uh, uh, yes, well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your time. Look forward to hearing from, from everyone on the call if they uh, want to know more or do more in this field. Uh, thank you to Franco for supporting me, thank and you. to Sheila for leading the organization at Building Smart Central. 
Okay. Okay. See you, see you, see you to the next open house in six yeah. months. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There will be more news. <laughs> that, that we can be sure of. So, yeah. so thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.